start. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I had started talking about, you know, sort of our basic um, principles of, you know, rotating machines. Um, and in particular, I started talking about the notion of a synchronous machine. And we're going to, I'm going to just look real quick one more time at sort of the basic idea of how these, how the fields work in one of these machines, but wanted to, to kind of reiterate some of the critical points. Um, so what you're looking at here is a cross section of what would be a cylindrical machine. So in other words, you know, it would be a long cylinder. Synchronous machines are typically what we use for generators. All right. And that's um, really, I mean, they're, they're commonly used nowadays for motors, but we're learning them really in the context of what we would see if we had uh, a generator. Now, what we talked about the other day is, or we've talked about really throughout the course of last week, is the fact that this is a three-phase machine. And as a three-phase machine, what that means is that it's going to have a three-phase set of windings. So what we see here, and I look at this cross-section, I've got a winding here and there, and then 120 degrees offset from that is the B winding and 120 degrees offset from that is the C winding. Now, what I've, what I've shown is basically locating all of these windings as if they were at one location. And the reality is that these windings would actually be sinusoidally distributed. So here I wrote what the, what the winding distribution would be for, um, for this particular, for phase A, for this particular machine. All right, um, which is to say, you know, how they would be be structured. And I've done this in general for what I call a P-pole machine. And I'm going to de determine today and describe more about what I mean by that. But what I say here is I've got a two-pole machine. And as a two-pole machine, what that means is that I have one set of north and south poles as I go around the, the, the air gap of the machine. So just as a real quick recap, um, you know, we talked last week and said, okay, if if I do, if I go around in a circle, um, you know, and follow the field lines, let's say for phase A, what I see is that if I look at the air gap, my field goes from stator to rotor on one side of that winding and from rotor to stator on the other side. And if if we if we go through the ways that I've I've defined the angles right here, what we're going to see is that at 90 degrees. We go from stator to rotor, we call that negative. And then at 270 degrees, it flips back over. So this is basically the B field in the theta direction. If my windings are set up like this, all right, in other words, where they're when I say they're set up so that they're concentrated at one point, then my B field becomes a square wave in that air gap. Okay. What we said is we actually take the windings and we we distribute them more like so. So they're sinusoidally distributed. So what that means is that there's a lot of windings up here on phase A. There would be a lot of windings up here at the top. And then there'd be fewer here and then fewer here and then fewer here until I got all the way to zero at zero degrees. Okay. So if we have that, the picture I'm going to show, that's why I didn't go full screen here. The picture that we show is this. All right, so what I have right now is what would happen if I were to put a sinusoidal current, so as a function of time, that's what we're seeing on the top here. So what I want to do is, is if we look at this image here on the left, what you see is what happens with this winding distribution. So um, right there on the left side, what you see is, is when the, if I have a, sinusoidal current going into the sinusoidally distributed winding, what I see is that my magnetic field is sinusoidally distributed throughout the space of the rotor air gap. So what it's shown here on the bottom is basically what the, what the field looks like as a function of angle. And what we see is that as a function of angle, basically it's sinusoidal and it's, you know, you see it growing now in time and then it's gonna to start to get smaller in time and reverse its direction. And, and the reason for that is because in this particular case, it's showing what happens if I have a sinusoidal current in that winding. So sinusoidal current in the sense that it's varying with respect to time. I wanna stop there for a second and see if that basic principle of what I'm showing here, if that makes sense or not. <clears throat> 
Let's see if you guys have any questions associated with that. You guys may not be in a good place to ask questions based on where you are in the classroom. Okay. All right. What so this this thing on the left here, right? That's a, that's our two pole machine. So what I see with this two pole machine is basically that there's, you know, as I go around the rotor one time, I basically have one period in my B field. If I look at what I see here on the right side, this would be a four pole winding. And what I see is as I go around the rotor essentially one time, what I see is that I have two variations in that B field, okay? If I had a six pole machine, I'd have three variations. An eight pole machine, right? I'd have four variations, right? It just continues along those lines. And what we said the other day, and again, we're not gonna get too focused on the details of this, but what you see here is this is only putting a current into phase A. If I put a current into phases B and C, then what I get from that is basically this scenario, right? So phase A is shown here in the upper left. Phase B is shown here in the middle. And phase C is shown over here on the right. Effectively, what we, you see is the sum, each of the individual fields is basically sinusoidally distributed in space and then growing and shrinking. And they're shifted, if you notice, if I look at phase A and phase B, they're offset spatially by 120 degrees. And phase C is offset spatially by 120 degrees from that. The summation of the field from A, B, and C produces a field that rotates as a function of time. And that is what makes this machine work so well, all right? So what I wanna do is understand how this thing now works within an electrical circuit. And that's where most of our problems that we analyze really come in is what happens when we operate this thing within an electrical circuit, okay? All right, so with that, I'm gonna jump over to my slides. All right, so let me go to my full screen view. All right, so basically what we're gonna do is in this particular case, I'm gonna have these sinusoidally distributed windings and I'm gonna put into each winding basically a set of sinusoidally distributed currents that are distributed, when I say sinusoidally, sinusoidally in time, okay? Now, the other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically start talk about what I do in the rotor. So in the rotor, we have what we call the F coil or the field coil, all right? That field coil will also be distributed sinusoidally, all right? Along, but it, the thing about the field winding is the rotor is moving and the rotor moves at a speed omega m, all right? That is the speed of this particular thing. So we defined here basically the angle theta r, which is the angle between what's the, the axis of the a, a winding field and the F coil field, all right? So we have that particular rotor angle. Now, the important thing here is I put a DC current into the rotor, all right? So I put a constant DC current into the rotor. That'll get a little bit confusing later when we, we deal with this. Um, but we have we have three phase currents in the stator and we have a DC current in the rotor. All right. So um, I want to just sort of talk about how does this thing operate when we have this thing um, within a circuit. So I'm going to define a couple of different things. The, the DC current goes into the field coil, into the rotor. And then in the stator, we basically have ultimately three sets of um, three currents that are a balanced three phase set. And so I've used the angle phi, which is what we define to be our power factor angle. So phi is basically equal to the angle between the voltage and the current, all right? So that's the angle between those, that's, that's important. So when we hook this thing up, all right, this is what I said the other day and where I sort of ended the other day is we, if we're using this thing as a generator, what we're doing is we're saying we take phase A, phase B and phase C, and we hook them up to a balanced three phase set of voltages, right? So basically, you know, we're gonna see this in a little bit, but um, what I do sometimes is I define what I call kind of a, a one line diagram, where I say, I'm gonna take my generator, 
and I'm going to hook it up to a grid. And the grid has these voltages over here, and the generator is basically going to start pushing its current into the grid. All right, so, so that that is basically what I'm trying to frame up here is how this thing operates as a generator. And so in phasor notation, the currents and voltages would be written like this. So notice what I did there is I, I basically, if I look at the voltage, I say its amplitude is V. So when I talk about its phasor, I write V over square root of two, right? So that's an important piece of, of the way we define this, right? I've done this and I've done my phasors in RMS, okay? And I say that the phase A voltage is at zero degrees to keep everything simple, all right? So those, that's the set setup that I'm gonna use in trying to get this thing connected into the grid. All right, now, one thing I wanna talk about real quick is, is just talking about what happens when I have a machine um, with a different number of poles than two. Two is a fairly simple setup. And as we'll see, in this particular case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rotate the rotor so that it moves at two pi 60, where this, so I'm gonna say it rotates at 60 Hertz, or very often we would say 3,600 revolutions per minute. Now, if I have a four pole machine, I would rotate that at half the speed, all right? So in other words, if I had a four pole machine, so P, in a four pole machine, I have P equal to four, and what I say is that this, the speed of it would be four over two. <clears throat> if, it's gonna, if it's gonna connect to a grid that is 60 Hertz, then the speed at which I rotate this thing would be 30 Hertz, right? So essentially the speed for a P-pole machine is always, a, is slower by a factor of P over two, all right? So in other words, for a 60 hertz machine, for, for a two-pole machine connected to a 60 hertz grid, this guy spins at 60 hertz. For a four-pole machine, he spins at 30 hertz, right? Or basically 60 divided by P over two. I call that the mechanical speed, right? Um, the mechanical speed here, right, is the, is the speed at which the thing actually rotates. All right, so in, in general, we refer to it that way. And I should write this, I guess, in terms of, given the way I wrote that as, as in radians per second. All right, so 60 Hertz is always P over two times the mechanical speed. All right, and that's a common question that, that comes up in, in things like the FE exam and places like that, okay? All right, and we'll do lots of examples of this sort of thing. All right, so um, the, the definition here is that the, the rotor moves at a speed omega m. And if I'm hooking up to a grid, the stator field, in other words, the, the field that's produced by um, the stator windings is always moving at a speed omega, all right? Which in order to get this machine to work properly, the rotor field moves at a speed p over two times omega m. So the important thing here is that omega, which is the grid frequency, all right, the grid frequency, is always equal to p over two times omega m. All right, so we, the grid frequency is usually stuck with us as two pi sixty, and then we can figure out the actual speed from there. Now, where does this come up? Um, if you look at like a nuclear power plant or a coal-fired power plant, typically those are two or four pole machines. But if I was looking at a hydroelectric power plant, for instance, they might be a thirty pole machine or a forty pole machine, and which means that they move very slowly. All right, um, but we'll we'll do a number of problems um, related to that as we as we move through the the semester. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, um, what I want to do real quick is I you know with this basic notion I want to figure out how I derive the basic circuit model. All right. What I've written out here in general for this p pole machine, where what I have is that the field winding is moving. So I've shown here a four pole machine in this picture. All right. So I can see for the four pole machine, I see for coil A starts here, has a return here, has a second set of turns here, and, a, and the return side of that second set of turns there. And they would be connected in series with each other. All right. What I'm, what I'm showing here is that 
um, since I've got four sets of windings, there are going to be four sets of fluxes that happen. And for each of those four fluxes, there's basically going to be, um, within, each, within each of those four fluxes, there's four components, right? So I wrote this in matrix form to kind of keep it compact, right? So if I was looking at phase A, I would multiply everything in this first row with everything in this column, and that leads to this, all right? So if I look at phase A, the flux linking phase A has a self-flux, all right, so we call this a self-flux. And then all of these terms here are mutual fluxes. So we've talked about the fact that LAB um, and LAC are equal to each other, right? So we're not going to worry about that too much, but this is basically the, the flux linking coil A from the current in phase B. This is the flux linking coil A from the current in phase C. And this piece here is the flux linking it from coil F, all right? Now the important thing is, because the field coil on the rotor is moving, and we said that the rotor angle is omega t plus theta naught, all right? If I plug that in here, what I see is that the flux linkage from the rotor is changing as a function of time. And that's really important because what it means is that if I put a DC current into that field coil, that is going to produce, produce a time varying flux in phase A, and that time varying flux will ultimately produce a voltage. So one thing I wanna point out here is, um, you know, I say that this thing is, is moving, and I should be careful, that is theta R is omega MT. In other words, this is the mechanical speed of the device. And this angle here, theta naught, basically says, where is the rotor sitting? at the beginning of each period or at time t equal to zero. All right, there's a lot of messy math here, but the thing I wanna do is whenever I have a flux linkage, I can begin to think about how this relates to an electrical circuit model. And that's what I wanna do, right? All right, so to do that, let's look at the phase A flux. All right, so on the previous slide, we said phase A flux has a self flux, LAIA, plus these two terms, LAB, LABIB plus LABIC plus M cosine P over two times theta R. So I'm gonna write theta R as omega MT plus phi naught all times IF. So I'm gonna bring that IF up here. All right, so I want to simplify this a little bit. So we said previously that, you know, we made the argument that LAB is equal to negative one half LA. And where that came from is the fact that LAB is basically LA times the cosine of 120 degrees, which if I do the math works out to be negative one half LA. All right. So just to simplify this a little bit, I can rewrite this thing as LA... I A minus one half L A times I B plus I C. So what I do is I group these two terms. Both of them have L A B, right? And because L A B is minus one half L A, I get that result right there. And then I have this other piece kind of hanging off M I F cosine P over two times omega mt plus theta naught like that. All right, now the important, the other important thing that we know here, what's true about the sum, if I have a balanced three-phase set of currents, what's true about IA plus IB plus IC? All right, I wanna hear your guys' voices on that one for a second. What is the sum of those? Zero? Zero, that's right. So what that tells me is that I A is equal to minus I B plus I C like that. So I can use that result, plug it in here, and this whole thing becomes lambda A equals three halves L A I A plus M I F cosine P over two omega mt plus theta naught, like that, all right? 
So that's the flux in there. Now, what I want to do is I want to say, I want to actually hook this thing up to a circuit, okay? So if I'm hooking this thing up to a grid, all right, what I know is that anytime I have a changing flux, a d lambda by dt, there is a voltage that is created. What I'm showing here is, is not to say that I'm hooking an inductor up to the grid, but I'm basically saying, okay, let's think of the phase A winding. It's just, just the winding, and I'm hooking it up to the grid. So A to A prime is hooked up to, to, to basically VA neutral on the grid, all right? Now, what I'm going to do is say, all right, that the voltage that's induced has to be related to the derivative, the time derivative of the flux linkage. So I'm going to say is that VA equals negative d lambda a by dt. Now, the reason I'm doing negative here is because of what I'm saying, and normally we would say just d lambda by dt, but what I'm doing is I'm actually saying that I want the current to flow out of the circuit and into the grid, okay? And, and that's a common way of, of defining this because what I'm doing is I'm defining this thing as a generator, all right? So I'm using the negative sign when I have a generator. If it was a motor, the current would have to flow into the machine. But in, again, in general, you're gonna see with the problems that we solve in these sorts of things, we're normally focused on the currents flowing out of the machine, all right? So I'm gonna say that becomes negative D by DT of lambda A, which we wrote on the previous slide was three halves L A I A plus M I F cosine P over two omega M T plus P over two times theta naught like that. Okay. So what I do is I take the derivative of those two things. All right. And so I'm trying to get this ultimately into a circuit model. And when I, when I do that, all right, I get this to be negative three halves LA times D by DT of IA. Plus then I get the time derivative of the cosine thing. So help me out. So if I take the time derivative of this thing, what's the time derivative of that, that whole thing? What would be the derivative of cosine something times T? So it would turn into minus sign and then everything in front of the T inside the P over two omega yep. M comes out to the front. Yep. So P over two omega M M I F sine P over two omega M T plus P over two theta naught. All right. So um, this gets a little bit tricky for a second, but I want to just look at this. If, if I gave you this, all right, so I'm saying VA of T is a voltage source, all right, that I'm hooking this machine up. So when I look at, there's two terms here. There's this term and there's this term. How would you model the, these two terms if I had to make a circuit model? So I have a voltage source VA. All right, so this three halves LA DIA by DT, what is that? What, what kind of a component is that in the circuit? What would that be? Well, it's basically an inductor, right? So I have, a, I have an L times a DI by DT, okay? What's the second term over here? What's this guy? How would you model that in a circuit? It's basically a voltage source, right? And so if I, if I take this whole thing, I'm going to come back to, to writing this thing in the frequency domain, but basically what I'm saying is, is it's a voltage source. So I call this, I call that term right here, I call that EAF. I'm going to give that a name. Basically, it's the voltage um, or electromotive force between coil A and F, all right? And I call this inductance here L sub D, all right, which is three halves LA. All right, so let me, let me, let's me let go back to this. This is what we wrote on the previous slide. So if I, when I say the frequency domain, I mean writing it in a phasor domain. So I say VA. All right, you guys help me. What do I do if I convert this expression to the phasor domain? What do I do with this term right here? Since it's derivative, you have to multiply by S for J omega. J omega, yeah. So I'm going to make that minus 3 halves LA. 
times, so I'll, I'll put the j omega out, I guess all the way out front. So I'll say negative j omega times three halves la i a. And the thing I have over here, okay, is omega m i f. I want to point something out between this slide and this slide. What I did was I made the, I, I substituted in what we just showed already is that omega, the grid frequency, is P over two times omega M. I plugged that in here. So in other words, this became an omega and this became an omega. All right. So you can see why we spin the rotor the way we do. The way we, the reason we spin the rotor slower if we have more poles is so that the frequency of the voltage that is created matches what the grid frequency is, all right? So if I'm going to the phasor domain, what do I do with this term right here? Minus omega m i f sine omega t. So first of all, I shouldn't have sine if I'm going to the phasor domain. So I have minus m, minus omega m i f sine, let's pull it aside, omega t plus p over 2 theta naught. If I go to the phasor domain, what, what am I supposed to do with all of my sines? What do I do with all the sine functions before I can convert it to a phasor? What do I have to do with all the sine functions to go to the phasor domain? I got to convert into a cosine, right? So how do I convert sine to a cosine like that? You guys remember? Shift in side by 90 degrees. Yep. So basically I say omega, negative omega m i f cosine omega t plus p over 2 theta naught minus 90 degrees like that. Okay. And if I convert that to the phasor domain, I need to say that this becomes, and I'm going to say minus, it's not, I'm, just, I'm going to forget the minus sign here for a second. I'll just treat the minus sign as a, as a subtraction here. But basically this guy becomes um, omega m i f like that over the square root of two with an angle of p over two theta naught minus 90 degrees like that. Now, why did I do that over square root of two? Why did I do that to do to go to the phasor domain? What am I doing when I do that? Put it in an RMS. Yep, putting it in an RMS, right? So I would add that term down here. So there's a omega, minus omega m i f over two um, with an angle p over two minus 90 degrees like that, okay? All right, so essentially what I have what I ultimately have, by the time everything is all said and done, I end up with the result that I have right here, okay? Which if I, if I look at this circuit and I do a KVL, what I'll see is that the KVL matches to that, what I just derived, okay? So this guy here is basically what I call EAF, right? which is the voltage that is induced in this particular thing, all right? That is the, the final, you know, kind of result um, that, that we typically use, all right? And I'm going to make some definitions here. The definitions I make, um, this 3 halves LA, I get rid of that, and I have, I basically call that LD, or the synchronous inductance, right? There's a reason why we use D. It seems like it should be S if I call it the synchronous inductance. Um, but we usually call it L sub D. And I define this angle here, this P over two theta naught minus 90, I define that as delta, okay? All right, and so I rewrite that whole thing like so, all right? That result we're gonna use significantly as we go throughout the rest of, of the semester and kind of thinking about this thing. So I, here's kind of a summary of, of all of this, all right? Um, what I've written out here is this, this power angle, all right, delta, so delta, which is P over 2 theta naught minus 90 degrees, we call that the power angle, 
That's important because it relates to the power flow that's happening in this particular situation. Um, this angle delta, all right, is basically the angle between the the voltage source here between this voltage source and this voltage source. All right, and, and that makes sense because this guy here is, as I've got written over on this side, um, VA has an angle of zero degrees, IA has an angle of five because there's, we're assuming there's a power factor potentially, and EAF, which is gonna confuse everybody a little bit, but there is this omega MIF divided by the square root of two that, that comes into play with this one, all right? So here, this, this slide's really crucial because it shows the relationships between all of those two guys, all right? So I want to point something out here. There's two critical angles, right? One is this angle phi, which is the power factor angle, which is the angle between the voltage and the current. And then delta is the angle between VA and EAF, all right? So we're going we're gonna to need both of those things as we kind of move through. Now, Wednesday, we're going to do a fair number of examples, um, or, or we're, we're going to work through an example that uses this stuff, but I wanted to introduce it here today. All right, the other thing we want to quickly work through here is, is what's the power production, all right? So real quick, I want to ask you guys, how would I solve for, if I had this particular circuit, how would I solve for the current IA? And I want to do that in the phasor domain. So how do I find IA? How would that be defined here? Help me out in terms of the in terms of the components that I have right here. How would I define that? Are we talking phasers or? Yeah, let's do it in phasor domain. Be the difference between the two voltage sources mm -hmm. divided by J omega L. Yep. So EAF minus VA. If the current's defined to be going into VA. So it's those two divided by J omega LD like that, okay? And so I've got that current. Now, what I want to do is I want to define what the power is going to be, all right? And, and I'm going to, real quick, I'm going to plug in um, our results here real quick. So EAF, all right, what well, we showed on the previous slide, EAF is omega MIF over the square root of two, all right? with an angle of delta, little delta, okay? Minus VA over square root of two with an angle of zero degrees, all over J omega LD, like that, okay? All right, so if, if, I, if I wanna figure out the power all right, and again, I'm doing a single phase here. This guy's ultimately a three-phase machine. So the total power coming out would be whatever SA is plus SB plus SC like that. All right, how does that, how do I do that in terms of the voltage and the current? How do I figure out the power, the complex power here on a single phase in terms of the voltage and the current? How would I write that in phasor term? Comple how does complex power relate to voltage and current? VI conjugate. Yep, VA times IA conjugate. So basically, um, whatever my VA is times all of that stuff right there, EAF minus VA all over J omega LD like that. Okay. If I carry through this result, all right, and I, and I go through the math, ultimately what I do here is I write everything out like so. The P value is this, the Q value is that for a single phase, all right? And if I want to talk about what's going on across the entire machine, I multiply each of those by three. So you can see there's a number of formulas here, all right? And, and I want to point out in this particular case, all right, so the magnitude of VA is being written as V. The magnitude of EAF is written here, um, is, is, is just written as the magnitude of VAF, all right? Um, and so in, in this context, what I see is that the power, 
is a function of this angle, which is the angle between this voltage and this voltage. All right, so we're going to look at some examples of this. I'm going to give you basically an example, just like one of the homework problems um, that we're going to do on Wednesday, all right, um, to go through this. A lot of material that, that I went through real quick, um, but we're going to go through an example of that Wednesday. I didn't think there would be enough time to go through a full example here today, um, but we're going to take the entire time on Wednesday to go through an example, which will be just like the problems that are going to be on homework eight, all right? So I'm going to stop there.